So what, the way we'll proceed, we've got a half hour and then we've got a great lunch planned. The way we'll move forward with this is um, I'll get them talking among themselves a bit and then we'll open up to you and you can ask questions to any or all of them or some combination thereof. Um, I'll get us going and this is just with a first question about comparing some of the concepts and some of the themes between the papers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, Fred, you were talking about primary and secondary creation. Everyone, well, both of you at some points were talking about primary and secondary causality. You referred to immediate creation. Can you help us map, yeah. either of you, help us map these concepts on each other? Because there, there could be a way of taking this where what Pope means by secondary creation is is or is pretty close to what um, Warfield means by immediate creation. Well, this is exactly what I was hoping to okay. talk about. All right. So thank you. Yeah, um, when Warfield is discussing Calvin and discussing Wolebius in connection with that, he, uh, remember I said that um, his view, that he sees Calvin's view as not being what Wolebius later will do, and he refers to Wolebius's later view as the what the uh, old Reformed divines called primary and second, or first, excuse me, first and second creation. In fact, I'm, I'm, that's why I pulled this up here. I Pope want to check if it's note. first and second rather than primary and secondary. Pope doesn't put note any of that where, where he gets it. He, he doesn't treat it like something he just made up, but you know, he doesn't interact with any earlier literature. But uh, uh, anyway, the, the terms really are there. Secondary creation is immediate creation, primary creation is this other thing. And uh, apropos of uh, uh, Professor Schwebel's uh, comments, uh, Warfield says here um, that Calvin teaches that it is only when we contemplate God in providence that we can form any true conception of him as creator. And then he goes on to discuss this, that the whole providential thing is dependent upon God having called first the very... Uh, being into existence, right? Other being than himself into existence and the possibility of that. So I do think that this really lines up, but it's very interesting to me. Um, Pope doesn't cite any of this discussion. No, he doesn't. So if he's getting it from Wolibius or anyone like that, he doesn't say so. Yeah. Um, yeah, he just launches into it like, here's a conceptual distinction that is very useful and begins using it. And I wonder, since you referred to the classical pre-Christian tradition there as having the, some distinction between first and secondary, uh, I'm just wondering if the Reformed scholastics, who are often accused of having intruded a new Aristotelianism into their theology, are drawing on something farther back like that themselves. Mm. But I don't know if anybody here would know the answer to that. Yeah. So now I want to further connect Steve Long's question with Kevin's paper, okay? So we've got the uh, primary secondary causality distinction. And you said sometimes this is taken to mean, a, to entail a kind of compatibilism. Um, I, I've never seen how, personally, how that entails any kind of compatibilism. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the Christian tradition hasn't seen that. But could you talk to us about what Schleiermacher is doing with this? I mean, both Warfield and Pope are, I mean, this is a sort of part and parcel of their inheritance. They're making use of primary secondary distinctions, uh, and they think it's still doing, con still gives them the tools with which to do constructive theological work. Mm -hmm. What's going on with this with Schleiermacher? I mean, he's doing something very different in some ways, so can you help us understand better how this, how these, what's he doing with these tools? Sure. Um, these tools aren't his tools. Yeah. His tools are primarily from the Reformed tradition. Um, I mean, there's a, you, you probably ought to read this as a distinctively reformed approach to these issues, right? So there's the uh, single divine decree uh, of reconciling love that is at the root of everything, and that produces a single fabric of all that is, all of which is ordered toward that reconciling love. Uh, and how do I put this? There is at least a high degree of comfort with some amount of determinacy right, uh, within nature and to some extent within uh, morality, uh, right? So, I mean, uh, th that's where he draws most of his resources. And so his most famous and often misconstrued quotation about the relationship between theology and science is, we need to come up with an eternal covenant 
between theology and science, and he locates that specifically within the Reformed tradition. Right? This is part of the Reformed tradition itself is that uh, we, we will be working to see how these things hang together, precisely because we take it for granted that in God, all things hang together. So it's just a different sensibility and a different set of tools, I suspect. So you mentioned the decree, and uh, when Warfield and the Princeton theologians are talking about the decree, uh, they're often very concerned about matters of predestination and reprobation. And I'm just wondering, in Schleiermacher's version of the decree as this decree of reconciling love, is there any room for reprobation? Yes. And what does that look like? <laughs> um, no, but, but Schleiermacher is actually pretty cagey about this. Okay. And he offers, us, um, he offers us principled reasons for being uh, very humble about talking with respect to any kind of eternal reprobation, because he also thinks it's, it's um, in the nature of in the nature of the case, this is something beyond that which we can think about. Because mm -hmm. we can think only in continuity with this world. The more we think in continuity with this world, the more we can make sense of eternal life one way or the other. But the more we do that, the less we're talking about eternal life. The more we play up the discontinuity, the more we might be able to think of it as eternal life, but the less we'll be able to think about it, right? So mm -hmm. he, um, his, the treatment of, uh, of eternal life in the Glaubenslehre mm -hmm. is one of giving principled reasons for not working out doctrines about it, right? But he does make space for a kind of reprobation. It's just that he's reticent to say more about it. Mm -hmm. Is it the, the limitation of, um, in the Glaubenslehre, the beginning with the consciousness of redemption? Is it, is it just hard to get to uh, any statement about reprobation if your systemic starting point is the consciousness of redemption? I think it's, uh, that's an interesting idea, but I, I suspect it's more to do with, um, there's, uh, there's, I mean, I think that it's long been recognized. There's a kind of um, tricky dialectic between continuity and discontinuity and trying to think about eternal life. Mm -hmm. right? So Bernard Williams, he has this famous essay about how eternal life would be uh, unbearably tedious. Uh, and it's insofar as it would be something that we, present day we, could desire, we would very soon tire of it, right? Because we, it would become just unbearable for us to just keep getting what we had desired. But on the other hand, insofar as we think about it as the sort of thing that wouldn't become unbearably tedious, it's in discontinuity with who we are now, and so couldn't be recognizable by us now as satisfying the desires that would lead us to want eternal life. Right? So I think that kind of continuity, discontinuity, dialectic in thinking about the relationship between present life and eternal life mm -hmm. is, is really what Schleiermacher has his finger on. And in that, I mean, I think at the very least he raises some interesting uh, difficulties in trying really to think through these doctrines. May I shift gears a little bit? I was going to shift too, so go ahead, yeah. I, I, so I'm, I'm especially interested in hearing both of you talk. Uh, if your figures ever talked to practicing scientists Good. and Thanks. counseled them about the implications of their theology for the practice of science, right? So if somebody came to them and said, I've read your books, I've heard your sermons, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm a practicing scientist, what, so tell me, what does this mean for the actual practice of science, right? Did they face this? If they didn't, how do you think they would face And just that? so, um, just so Kevin doesn't get off the hook by asking all the questions, <laughs> uh, we'll, you can answer the same question with respect to Schleiermacher. But I'd like to just, I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question now so we can see how the relation, but also see the, how they're distinct. Mm. The next question I want you to ask, and then we'll go to the audience. So we'll let you answer this question. And then we're going to push right back with the, with the further question, which is taking your historian's hats off and putting on your church theologian hats on. 
what insights, either positively or negatively, right? Either these are, these are good insights they had or these are mistakes they made. What lessons should Christians, especially either working in the sciences or pastors counseling Christians working in the sciences, what, what's like a good, you know, what's a good thing we should learn from Schleiermacher on this issue, Warfield, Pope? All right, but first the, histori the historical question that, that, um, that Kevin just asked. Yeah, well, I don't have anything in the text. I mean, he's got that one address to the um, British Academy of Sciences audience, but um, he doesn't do anything like, um, I mean, we may hear about this later with Ponenberg. Ponenberg's got the thing where he says, you know, if, the, if theology is true, sometimes we could propose ideas to scientists and they could see if that helps them with anything. He tries some stuff with the mm -hmm. old theory. I don't, I don't know of anything like that um, mm -hmm. going on in Pope. Um, he, I mean, maybe he's... Mm, his imagination, his scriptural imagination, he might be multiplying the, the, the stuff he does with other worlds, you know, like mm -hmm. multiple worlds. He, he uses this sort of mm -hmm. vast sort of account of layers of previous cycles of worlds. And, and you kind of wonder what he's specifically thinking about if he's trying to kind of deal with the uh, expanding narrative mm -hmm. of, of geological time. Uh, but he seems to be overshooting that mark and actually thinking even more broadly. Well, for Warfield, he's, he's a member of a, um, you know, generations spanning Princeton tradition that uh, is all about encouraging science and any area of human inquiry to go and do its thing, mm -hmm. kind of trusting, I mean, you know, Charles Hodge is famous for saying that the scriptures, the facts of scripture are to the theologian what the rocks are to the geologist, right? That there's a kind of common, um, scientific method, actually, that's being employed across the board. And uh, so there's this, there's this conviction about the unity of truth, that all truth is God's truth, and a um, perhaps naive uh, 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 confidence in scientific method as yielding this truth. So they're very, very willing to let the scientists do their thing as long as they don't slip in there uh, these... Um, uh, anti-supernaturalistic presuppositions masquerading as conclusions of science. Mm -hmm. um, so Warfield, I mean, one of the things I like very much about Warfield is the way that he has what I think is a truly cheerful and confident demeanor towards what is going to be found in, uh, in archaeology or in paleontology or anything else. He says, go for it. Just don't import into there your anti-supernaturalistic biases. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Um, and and uh, also would say, you know, respect us, that we actually have a domain of inquiry that uh, has a, a place on the map, too. Uh, Warfield actually, quite famously, in a, a piece he wrote called The Idea of Systematic Theology, gives a chart, a, a picture of uh, the relationship of systematic theology to various other branches, and he very famously puts apologetics down at the base of this thing, although the way he actually orders it on the page, it's above, but it, if I did the visual, it would be at the bottom, so that, it looked like, so that it looked like a foundation. He has it going down the page because that's order as your eye is moving down the page. Mm -hmm. But he has the natural sciences um, uh, informing apologetics, and then apologetics uses the data from an, of natural science and his history and so forth in order to consider questions of God, and Christianity and the scriptures as being the revelation of that God. And then, uh, and then once you've established uh, sufficient grounds for trusting in the Bible, then you start doing your biblical theology, bring in some of the insights from history, and then at the end of all of that, you do your systematic theology. Yeah. So um, they're very committed to this idea of, um, of science being done by anybody, not necessarily done by people with Christian presuppositions, as uh, needing to have a pretty free hand, but you got to watch them because <laughs> they tend because they tend to smuggle in these kind of anti-supernaturalistic. So, so I mean, you've got to watch all of us, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, um, same question, and then and then we'll follow up with the question of you know what Warfield or Pope or Schleiermacher would say to Francis Collins. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take the first of those. Um, <laughs> so uh, it sounds like there's 
overlap here, but Schleiermacher is, is willing not just to sort of give a free hand to natural science, but to see it as having a real integrity, right? Mm -hmm. So science per se has a kind of integrity that um, it would be an overreach of the worst sort for theology to presume to tell scientists that mm -hmm. this is their mm -hmm. realm, period, right? They're not allowed to sort of say that. However, um, as I mentioned, he's, he's concerned about, um, he sees it as really uh, a temptation, a sinful kind of temptation, to absolutize natural science in such a way that it becomes um, seen as uh, precluding freedom, as precluding, mm -hmm. uh, right? If, if supernaturalism and naturalism come to seem like they're at odds with one another, that's where he thinks that scientists have um, given in to a sort of temptation, and he worries about that. He mm -hmm. thinks we're all susceptible to this temptation, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. we're all sinful, so we all give in to this temptation, but in any case, science too can exemplify that. Um, and I, I mean, I, take that to be interesting. I, I do think um, one, I tried to highlight some of that in the end of my paper to talk about ways of practicing attention in science and that cultivating a sense of wonder or appreciation. I, that strikes me as interestingly on the right track. Um, I think maybe I would also say just by way of differentiating a little bit what I take from your treatments of Warfield and Pope, um, so I, it seems like there's this emphasis on non-competitiveness between supernatural and natural in all three. Mm -hmm. But uh, for Schleiermacher, that's in some respects because at every moment, everything is both totally supernatural and totally natural, right? There is never, um, it's never, uh, at particular moments that God would intervene because creation itself is one long intervention of reconciling love, right? So the entire fabric of creation, the entire fabric of nature is itself the, the supernatural act, this one long supernatural act of redeeming creation and bringing it into union with God. Um, that strikes me as an interesting difference. Yeah, it is. Could so, I ask? I, then I'll do, sure. we'll do our thing, right? Yeah. But, but uh, you know, the question was asked before uh, about, um, well, nature read in tooth and claw, right? About death before the fall or, you know, anyway, the whole idea. So if Schleiermacher is seeing all of creation history as just being this reconciling love on the move, what, does he address the problem of animal suffering and death and, and this sort of thing? Uh, he does, but he, he doesn't offer a treatment of it in the Glaubenslar, so he mentions it. He gives a treatment of suffering and of evil more generally, and his main concern there is to decouple uh, suffering from sin in the sense that suffering is punishment for sin. Mm -hmm. um, right, one, in some ways, uh, so uh, there's this famous treatment of the Irenaean account of suffering and seeing Schleiermacher's exemplifying this. Um, right, so he's not, he's, he's frankly just not that concerned with uh, these things. He's, he's quite sure that we can see this as an instance of God's loving wisdom. Um, that doesn't mean, loving wisdom uh, doesn't mean everything is, as you said, sweetness and light. All right. So, taking off the helmets of history and putting on the um, breastplate of the breastplate of yeah, <laughs> the breastplate of, of constructive theology. Yeah. Theology and righteousness yeah, should not yeah. be identified. To the <laughs> yeah, we like that. Um, yeah. So I think I already commended um, Pope's uh, attempt to have it all to have some. Uh, rational apologetic argument that can happen in public and that would, uh, that would affect uh, primary creation considerations. Um, uh, and then his really keen eye on, on the growth of, of infidelity. I mean, that really, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a pretty sweet guy, it seems like, but that really made him mad. And uh, he, he wasn't above a rhetoric of mockery for, um, for the loss of faith. He didn't, 
he didn't like his heart didn't go out and treat it sympathetically and oh how, oh you poor wounded you know uh -huh. he, he would he would just go at it especially if, as he saw it inside of inside of his Christian structures he was involved with um, the the dissenters were by by necessity and by definition not involved with university work uh, they had to set up their own institutions and so they didn't have the pressure of reconciling their views to colleagues in the natural sciences uh, for good or for ill. And it does seem like it would have been good for Pope and people like him to, um, to have to face professionally some of the claims of the sciences. So I would add that as a, uh, you know, something to be desired in contemporary yeah. theology and church life. We need some Christian people who are bearing witness in those kinds of intellectual settings and uh, having to be responsible that way. Well, I've already said that I admire Warfield's cheerfulness and confidence as he approached these questions. I think that's something we really ought to seek to imitate. You know, if we believe that God really is the ground of all being and God's, wor uh, God's uh, purposes are being worked out in history and we have confidence that uh, we belong to him and he's in control of things, uh, we should not be afraid of science, right? Um, and uh, Warfield and his fellow Princetonians um, not only like encouraged science to do its thing, but then in interacting with science, even transgressing its boundaries and trespassing a little bit on the areas that belong more to theologians and philosophers, such as Darwin saying that natural selection made impossible any recognition of divine design in the world. Nakash said, Darwin's a fine scientist, but he's a bad philosopher. So let's, let's take the science that we've got there and let's sort of improve upon it and, and show. But even when complaining about uh, the anti-supernaturalistic and sometimes arrogant ways of science, uh, for the most part, I mean, I was just reminded of this by Fred's comments, they're very gentlemanly in the way they treat their opponents. They do not resort to mockery. They do not... Um, they certainly don't try to set up straw men and so forth and, and make a point of taking very seriously the arguments and the evidence that's presented. And I think that that's an important thing for us to imitate. Yeah. Thank you. Um, like you two, I think I've already said a handful of things about what I find interesting about Schleiermacher's approach. I'll add just one more that yeah. goes more clearly beyond him. Um, this idea of trying to think of theology as not in antithesis to science is a good one. But I think the, the crucial next step would be to have theology engaged with the results of actual science and not just what I call the idea of science, right? Um, so for instance, um, uh, there's a lot of empirical work in moral psychology uh, that I find fascinating in its own right, but I also think theology could be enriched by some engagement with it, and I also think, uh, I dare say, theology could at least potentially have something to contribute to it. You mentioned Pannenberg as an exemplar of this kind of approach. But that strikes me constructively moving forward as a really important step yeah. beyond engaging with the idea of science. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We have uh, questions. I'm going to reposition myself so I can see a little better. Wait, Danny Houck has the first one here. Just a quick question for Kevin. If I heard you correctly, you said that Schleiermacher was comfortable uh, with some determinacy. So would you say that he has room for indeterminacy as well in any aspect of his theology? So this is a great question that ranges into disputed territory. Um, it's it's clear that uh, he is comfortable with some degree of determinacy. Some read him as, uh, those who read him in light of his early appropriation of Spinoza, think that he's comfortable with determinacy all the way down, right? So that determination, full stop, is something that he's meaning to take on board and give it a kind of reformed twist. Uh, I don't think that's the best understanding of what he's up to, but I think there's, there's reason to think that's what he says. I think a better view is that he um, sees things operating according to the laws appropriate to them, 
and he distinguishes between that which operates according to natural law, where we can use natural, causal, more mechanistic kinds of categories to understand them, and things that operate according to uh, more personal or moral uh, or ethical sorts of <coughs> laws, and that's the, the social sphere, and that operates differently, right? Neither of which um, is outside of this sort of overall fabric of creation, but, but they operate according to their respective laws differently, and it strikes me that that second sphere is much less deterministic than the first. But again, this is hotly disputed territory in Schleiermacher studies. <coughs> Oh, Stephen Williams. Thanks very much. Um, I found all three papers, I must say, in discussion very, very illuminating, so thank you. Um, I presume, as panelists, you'd agree, and this goes back to the earlier phase of discussion, that we mustn't collapse two distinctions here. One is a distinction between primary and secondary creation, and the other is a distinction between primary and secondary causality. You can't map the one onto the other. I presume you would be in agreement on that. Yeah, I agree. I, I would just say you locate um, secondary causality. It has no place in primary creation. Right? There aren't there aren't other agents at work there. We're talking about the being of all things ex nihilo. So, so they would line up to that extent, but they're they're distinguishing different things. I don't really have anything to add to that. I'm fine with that. Since I have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> he says as he takes it. Yeah. <laughs> as Monty Python says, and now for something completely different. Um, Oliver O'Donovan has this interesting discussion in resurrection and moral order. And I'm wondering how it would map onto your thinkers. I don't know where Oliver gets this, but it's really rather fruitful. And I'm wondering if it comes uh, out of any of your reflection that we have to distinguish creation and providence, that providence is not creation. Mm -hmm. Creation is already perfect. It is not only good, it's perfect. Providence is only God's act after the wound to creation. So that the, he, and he thinks modern theology often collapses creation into providence uh, um, unjustly. That sounds like a different definition of providence altogether, to say that it's after the wound of creation. So providence is some kind of a, I don't know, band-aid or medicine? I mean, what does that mean? It's how God conducts a fallen world. It's what, it's what God does historically after, the, after yeah. the fall. That just strikes me as a very different definition altogether. I think of providence as being God upholding and sustaining and governing the world. And it's always struck me that this distinction between creation and providence becomes very difficult to understand once you start talking about evolution as a method of creation. So I thought it was very helpful, actually, to point out that evolution proper would be um, by secondary causalities, whatever they may be. Usually we think of them as natural natural law um, and then that uh, but but reserving God's prerogative right to intrude supernatural power as necessary so it seems to me that the the healing of the wound is maybe more a matter of immediate creation than of providence certainly redemption is a matter of God by his Holy Spirit drawing a person regenerating their heart uh, Warfield by the way regarding the human soul holds with Calvin who is not a traditionist, but a creationist, so that every human soul was created ex nihilo by God. It just seems to me that in this area of humanity and morality and everything else, it's not providence. It has to be something more. God is, you know, man is situated in a world that is upheld, sustained, and governed by providence, but God is doing his redemptive work by intrusions of supernatural power, and that's immediate creation, or even ex nihilo in the case of creating the soul. What, what strikes me about the Obama's uh, distinction as you describe it is uh, it recognizes the 
completedness of the work of the six days and the blessing of the Sabbath, and it it makes you think you would need another word, whatever you may say about the conduct of how things went during that mm -hmm. extended procedure of creation. Um, you would need another word for what picks up on day eight or however we're supposed to describe what comes after that first Sabbath in the biblical narrative. Um, and so just to put it really like, scholastically or hypothetically, would there have been providence, was there providence before the fall, like <laughs> from the completion of the creation project to the, the fall, was there providence in that intervening period? <laughs> Some of it's semantics, what should we call God's conduct of what goes on there, but it's important. Well, we are, uh, we've come to the end of this uh, time of discussion. Good news, there is lunch. Further good news, we'll be back here after lunch. Um, so we've got a lot to be thankful for now. Uh, would you join me first in uh, returning thanks for our food and then Lynn offering thanks to, uh, to our friends here. Lord, we give you thanks for this day, for this food we have before us. We pray that uh, our table conversation will be edifying and uplifting and that uh, food will be, a will be a blessing to us and, mm -hmm. and give us strength. Things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Will you join me in thanking Brad and Kevin? Thank